The most successful outcome for Eigenlayer would be Web3 offers a brand new Petri dish. Our job is to buy great tech at great prices. AI is also libertarian, right? Enable use case that people haven't been able to do today. The next hundreds of millions of players, and they will come to the market through mobile. My personal reason why I could be bullish in the next 12 months is Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Block Crunch Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Choi. I'm the founder of the Angel Fund Tangent. Um, and everything we discuss on this show is not financial advice and not reflective of our respective companies' opinions. Now, one of the biggest buzzwords of this year is restaking, and the go-to project in this vertical is obviously Eigenlayer. Now, today, even before the launch of the token, Eigenlayer has already attracted almost $8 billion in funds deposited. This makes it the fourth largest protocol by total value locked, according to DeFi Llama. So already, I'm getting a lot of messages from people saying it's either the most transformative thing to happen to Ethereum, but also increasingly more people are talking about potential systematic risk that comes with the concept of restaking. So as an angel investor in Eigenlayer, these are the questions that I've also thought a lot about over the past few months. So I'm really, really excited and grateful for Sriram, the founder of Eigenlayer, to come on the show to chat with us today. So welcome to the show, man. Hey, thank you so much, Jason. Really excited to be here. Looking forward to dive into uh, the depths of the project. Absolutely. So I actually stayed up last night and I went through a lot of your tweets and a lot of the transcripts for your podcast interviews. And I realized there's actually so, so much to go over. But I guess before we dive into the meat there, I love to kind of dial the clocks back a little bit with start with the origin, because I know you've been interested in P2P networks before 2008 uh, and doing your PhD there. And then you moved on to computational genomics, I think later, and then stumbled into crypto in 2017. And I heard that you almost began your journey by building on Cardano first. So I'm curious, you know, how did you go from that to deciding to build this kind of restaking idea? Yeah, no, actually, like we didn't, you know, we didn't begin by trying to build on Cardano. Uh, the story goes back even further. So, you know, in, in 2017, 2018, you know, around the end of 2017, actually, when I got to uh, know about blockchain, my first reaction was, you know, is this some kind of like a speculative bubble that, you know, and last time, you know, I worked on peer-to-peer -peer wireless networks that didn't turn out well. So I, I was a bit skeptical of the whole premise because, you know, centralized systems are more efficient and they have a way to like outrun decentralized systems. So that was the kind of starting point. But, you know, the when it turned for me is when we realized that, uh, blockchains can basically help us coordinate in the absence of trust. And just like the internet is the information superhighway, blockchains and crypto could be our coordination superhighway. That was the kind of like operating model. And and once I could see that, okay, actually, if, if trust is so central, if we can have a neutral decentralized source of trust, that can be like really valuable. But, you know, the, the particular problems we were working on at that time was, you know, how do you scale a consensus protocol? What properties can a consensus protocol have? You know, how would you build a data availability or an Oracle or other systems with various properties? What is the game theory for some of these things? What are the mathematical guarantees? This was kind of how we got introduced into it. And the obvious kind of thing we wanted to do was to get like, you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum to use some of these ideas. and. You know, we were so far away from the space and had no real uh, connections that we found it quite difficult to kind of understand like and, and interact with the crypto space. And, uh, you know, it appeared that the most kind of like uh, the, the only way we were seeing that people from the academic background were getting into blockchain and crypto was actually going and starting, hey, you know, here's a new consensus protocol. I'm going to build a layer one blockchain around it. And... We thought, okay, there's no other way. This is the only way to like take an idea at the level of a consensus protocol because you can't build it as a smart contract on Ethereum because the whole point is to change the way that the, the nodes come into consensus. And so I said, okay, maybe we should build our own like, you know, uh, layer one. And we were actually, you know, we took a very purist approach and we said like, let's first actually build the whole system before we even do a fundraise. So we had a project called Trifecta where we built the block, built a blockchain. You know, we were running it on 100 nodes at that time. There's an MIT Crypto Economic Summit video where we demonstrated running at like, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions per second. But that project never launched. And that's why, you know, if, if you're a listener and wondering where is this Trifecta blockchain, it doesn't exist. It was, uh, 
it 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 only has had a uh, short life you know lifetime as a kind of proof of concept so i because you know we the questions that we are got asked from investors and other people was hey okay you go, you got these 100000 transactions per second where is the user base where is the ecosystem how are you going to build all of this out and i said i don't know you know if blockchain is a thing you know fast blockchain is a thing and here is the thing that actually does it and from from that point actually you know one of the things that i realized is kind of like a fundamental problem for starting a new like you know decent less protocol is the source of trust right i couldn't just take it and throw it on top of ethereum if it was like that that would have been so amazing right like i just just like you write a smart contract and throw it on ethereum let the blockchain like supplies the trust so this is when i came up with this model that you know it's very simple once you state it basically like a general purpose smart contract blockchain is like selling trust and earning fees in return for selling trust and selling trust to whom to applications right so applications are choosing to live on top of a blockchain because it's consuming the trust okay so once i understood this economy the question was like how can we do this more generally like you know more than just smart contracts can we kind of like take the same set of nodes same economics and some more transfer it and we tried all kinds of things can you build it on bitcoin you know can you build it on ethereum uh and the the original set of ideas we had were not really related to restaking it was some kind of like a complex crypto economic game but the the core idea was hey now i know i can run a different virtual machine on top of a different different blockchain what would i do with that and this was you know in 2021 and one of the things we knew we could do was to run evm on non evm blockchains and so this was the kind of starting point of the kind of eigen layer project is we said oh let's bring evm to all the non evm blockchains and you know as a starting point we we took cardano because cardano was probably it had a barely functional smart contract programming environment at that time and what that meant was and and it was very difficult for developers to build on top of it so if we had evm easily virtualized on top of cardano that would be like a cool thing and you could do this on any blockchain you know it was not specific to cardano but it was a starting point for what we could do but you know as we were thinking about it one of the things that clicked to me was if the fundamental thing is your you want to have a common source of decentralized trust then building on distinct source of decentralized trust is replicated effort rather than aggregated effort and so the obvious place which was powerful and central for us to build was ethereum and so we wanted to then like think about how, what we would build on top of ethereum and at that time i actually had no good idea for what to build on ethereum and the the story is you know i had a, an interaction with uh, uh kyle samani of multicoin and you know pitching this uh, this idea that you can actually do virtualization of evm on non evm blockchains and kyle in his characteristic style said you know evm is a piece of you know star i don't want you know you should not be working on that <laughs> and i'm like okay <laughs> and then uh, you know i said oh no but you could run like arbitrary virtual machines on top of ethereum too like if you wanted and then he said no this is some kind of an optimistic type roll up it it will never work i said like why wouldn't it work because optimistic roll ups are going to be very expensive and i went back and we sat down with the team and we were trying to understand this peculiar statement i didn't know at that time went mm -hmm. through all the optimistic roll ups this is 2021 and found that the fees was much higher and i thought zk roll ups should be more expensive because i have to give a zk proof so why is an optimistic roll up more expensive it was because of data availability and all the costs were going into publishing data on ethereum and so we then said oh yeah you know now it all fit together we had been doing research on data availability for many many years before that so we said i know how to scale data let's just build that so we said okay we're building on ethereum we'll build data availability on top of it so now we have a killer application so that that was the beginning of how we decided to build on ethereum but also you know we we wanted to build on ethereum we just had didn't have a good use case you know at that time you know we didn't know what programming environment would be interesting we, i had all these like high level pictures where i'd say oh you can build ai you can build like databases you can build like gaming you know environments all these things but you know you have to start somewhere where you know there is market traction and we 
found that with data availability. So that's the origin of EigenDA and mm-hmm. EigenLayer on, on Ethereum. Add to this, what happened was we said, like, let's go to ETH Denver. You know, we're going to ETH Denver now next week, but this was, to, you know, 2022. And go to ETH Denver and hang out with all the people that I didn't know anybody that. I actually know zero people in, in Ethereum at that time. And I connected with the vibe of Ethereum, which was, you know, decentralization, permissionless innovation, censorship resistance. Mm-hmm. It felt like this community had a set of principles that they're anchoring on rather than, you know, either individuals or expediency towards profit or even a product, which felt very different to me. I came back and told a friend who was working in Google at that time, that imagine somebody just goes to a Google conference. They're not a Google stock owner. They're not a Google like, you know, programmer, they're not even a Google really like application developer. They just feel like they're a Google person at the end of a Google conference. That's how I felt at the end of ETH Denver. And so we decided to build on Ethereum after that. I see. Yeah, I think the, the three biggest lessons that I've learned over the past years of investing in this space is that Ethereum's greatest exports are three things, right? It's the liquidity of Ethereum, is the programmability of EVM and the ideology of Ethereum. And it sounds like to me that when I first saw Eigenlayer, I thought, okay, this is actually a project that helps expand this, you know, vastly beyond just the Ethereum chain itself. And I know you describe Eigenlayer as a generalized mechanism for anybody to build arbitrary distributed systems on top of the Ethereum trust network. And when my normie friends ask me, okay, what the hell does that mean? I basically explain to them, well, you can stake your ETH and not just validate for the ETH network, but for you know any project that chooses to borrow the security of this uh, you know of this stake. So I was actually quite fascinated because uh, I feel like I've seen the similar ideas before in like Polkadot or Cosmos. This idea of like shared security. So how much of the inspiration came from observing what is being done on other chains? What worked? What didn't work? I would say that uh, at least our own journey was uh, from, we started from looking at Bitcoin, uh, where we we were looking at, hey, you know, can you borrow trust from Bitcoin? And the set of ideas we got exposed to was mostly merge mining. The idea that you have a mining, common mining uh, power, and a lot of energy is expended on mining. Can you reuse that mining for other, like securing other blockchains? This idea was called merge mining back in in the day, and I think even Satoshi wrote about it in one of their, you know, Bitcoin talk or whatever. And the thing is, um, we looked at merge mining, and one of the big incentive problems in merge mining is if you merge mine Bitcoin and some other altcoin, the problem is you can attack the altcoin with impunity because I, you know. If, you, if there is an attack on the other chain, it doesn't do anything to my mining equipment or like my Bitcoin price is not affected by the attack that happens on this other chain or coin. So the crypto economics of Bitcoin is very uniquely tied to Bitcoin itself, which is that I have invested this bunch of money in like buying the mining hardware. And therefore, if I do some big harm and a majority tries to do an attack, then my mining hardware may become useless, you know, because, you know, the 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 BTC is not valuable anymore. So this was not the case for, you know, merge mining. And so the realization came from when you do staking, the dynamics are quite different because staking comes with slashing. The equivalent of slashing is like, going and finding out which miners behave badly and then burning their mining equipment, right? Like that's not even thinkable as a, as, as a possible strategy, right? Uh, but the thing with staking is, stake is intrinsically like, you know, on the chain and therefore you can burn the stake for misbehaviors on, on the chain. And this was such a powerful concept and then we realized that if you had a general purpose staking mechanism, you can transfer the crypto economic trust to arbitrary other services much more easily. We didn't know about much of the other other stuff like Polkadot or even Layer 2s or you know, what was going on in Cosmos or Avalanche at that time. But of course, later as you start exploring these ideas, you find, oh yeah, you know, these these other things are in this vicinity. And what we, I think, have built is the most generalized system for shared security, which is more general than all the other systems in in the flexibility with which trust can be offered and shared. So that that's how I'd phrase it in relationship with some of the other systems. 
like any networks or protocols, there's many different stakeholders. So obviously there's the restakers who are staking their ETH and then also choosing to provide security with that stake to other applications. There's the operators that run the network. But I think the concept of the AVS is quite interesting and not something that you know many people in crypto have kind of really come across before Eigenlayer. So can you help us explain you know, what exactly are these AVS? Maybe that's a good segue to talk about the, the origins of EigenDA as well. Yeah, um, AVS is actively validated services. It's a term that we coined to explain what types of things can be built on Eigenlayer. Because a lot of people look at Eigenlayer, you know, at least right now in, in the context of some kind of a DeFi protocol. It was never intended to be a DeFi protocol. It was intended to connect stakers and operators to innovators, people inventing new distributed systems and decentralized protocols to borrow and share the, the trust and security. And we had to come up with an umbrella term. You know, people usually think of these as chains, but we think chain is a very restrictive and a narrow way of thinking. Uh, so we think of these as services. And why service, right? Like, you know, in, in the cloud, there is an analogous thing called software as a service, right? Software as a service is you write a piece of software, throw it on AWS or Google Cloud and let it run there. And, you know, as people are using the software, you know, you pay for the cloud, but you also make money. And if the unit economics work out, then you're actually making money as a SaaS. But the most important thing for me in the structure of SaaS and cloud was how much open innovation that actually enabled. Because you have the cloud and you don't have to think about all the hardware and like how to run it and how to scale it and how to provision the enough amount of like compute to actually run your services. What happens is you have a, a very powerful system where anybody can come and innovate and build new SaaS services and put it on top of the internet. This led to super specialization, very, very narrow specialized SaaS services that were built. And lots and lots of people all around the world, like, you know, in places which could not compete on the hardware basis, could compete purely on a software basis. And this is a very interesting, important thing that happened with the internet. And so if you think of what is the analogous, analogous thing that can be done on, on top of the, the crypto blockchain infrastructure, that's what an AVS is, an actively validated service. An actively validated service is a service that you, uh, you know, write, and it is anything that requires decentralized validation, right? And these decentralized validated services are then like managed by Eigenlayer to make sure that all the node operators opt in, the enough stake is backing it, like how much particular attributable economic commitment has been backing that service. All of this accounting is managed by Eigenlayer, but as a creator, as an innovator, you can just write the service and put it on top of like uh, Eigenlayer. So that's the category of uh, actively validated services. It includes something like running a new layer one chain, but not exclusively running a chain. You may be running very specific services. And you know what might that service be? To take you know usual examples, it might be to run an Oracle, which fetches data from the internet, has a group of nodes agree that that's the correct data and then put it on top of a blockchain. It may be a, a bridge which reads data from another chain and then moves it on top of another chain. It may be a, a you know, an AI service, you may be sitting on Ethereum and you want to request some AI inputs and you know you need to run an AI inference to actually adjust the prices or something on top of your Uniswap pool. So these are all examples of services. There may be other like much more nuanced and specific services that show up on Eigenlayer, which you're already seeing. For example, uh, we see things like proof of location. Proof of location is I want to know where these nodes are placed. Can I run a decentralized service to know the location of these other either operators or users in a decentralized manner? And how might the decentralized nodes know it? By sending network latency information. Like, you know, I send a packet, when do I receive it back? If I can receive it back within like, you know, 30 milliseconds, it must be close to one of my locations. And if many, many nodes can do it in parallel and triangulate where the nodes are. So that's a really interesting kind of piece of information. So proof of location, is an, that, that's an example of a service. But we've seen all kinds of different services. I would say like 20 categories of services that are kind of building on top of Eigenlayer. So that's the AVS actively validated service is a category. 
I can go into some of these examples, but that's a high level uh, overview. Yeah, and given how diverse these use cases can be, I'm curious, uh, and this is something that a lot of people are discussing as well, in terms of the security assumptions, because uh, you mentioned the concept of slashing. So let's say if someone is restaking for like 20 different applications, one of those applications happened to do something bad, and you know the validator has to be slashed. Uh, what does that process look like, and you know how do we how do we think about the implications for the entire kind of uh, you know eigenlayer stack? The uh, the way to think about it is slashing is encoded into smart contracts that talk to the eigenlayer contract. Whenever a staker is opting into a new AVS, they're basically opting specifically into an AVS contract. And the AVS contract specifies the conditions of registration, the conditions of payment, and the conditions of slashing. So basically, who can come in, what's the positive incentive, what's the negative incentive to do this stuff. And those are encoded in the AVS contracts. And so now, when uh, when a staker opts into a bunch of AVSs, what they're actually saying is, I'm opting into these bunch of conditions of like positive and negative incentives, and I need to do this bunch of work to actually keep up my uh, positive incentives. And if the contracts, if the slashing conditions are written in code on Ethereum smart contracts, the, and you know, for a moment, let's assume there are no code programming errors, which we have to deal with. But you know, then essentially what you're saying is you're opting into rigid, objectively verifiable slashing conditions, which are written in code on Ethereum. And what that means is, if I know that I'm running the software correctly, I won't get slashed by this, you know, by this contract. In fact, I may even run a piece of code we call an anti-slasher. What an anti-slasher does is whenever I issue a signature, it checks that this signature will not trigger slashing you know, before it issues the signature. And so this kind of an anti-slasher can be run locally. And so you know that you will not get slashed if you actually, if the contracts are correctly written. So that's the first level, which is as a staker, you're opting into objectively verifiable rigid conditions return as smart contracts on Ethereum. So the trust model is very similar to the other kind of trust model when you're going and opting into a Uniswap or a Aave or any of these kinds of DeFi protocols. But to protect users even more, we have another layer of protection because we know that code can sometimes be buggy. And we see this all the time in crypto, like sometimes you know a protocol has a buggy code and then like suddenly people lose their funds. And this is something we are taking a cautious approach to. And the way we, take the cautious approach is by actually having what we call a slashing veto committee. This is a committee of external parties, you know, experts in kind of protocol design who can actually vet whether the contract triggered the slashing for a, you know, on, on, on the actual protocol or it was a bug that le led to the slashing. If it is adjudicated as a bug, slashing does not happen. So therefore slashing requires two distinct things, the objective contract to trigger the slashing and the kind of human committee to approve it. Otherwise, slashing is not fulfilled. So we, you know, in the balance of powers between stakers and AVSs, we lean on protecting stakers because, you know, stakers are basically like underwriting the system with their own like risk. And the, and the guarantee we want to give to a staker is if you are not malicious, you will not be slashed. So slashing is there only for absolutely attributable attributable actions that the staker or operator took, which are malicious, not for regular operations where they made a configuration mistake or the, the program had a bug or anything like that. So because, you know, when you're building a pseudonymous system where anybody can come in and participate, you need to protect the system against like malicious actors infiltrating the system. So you need a system of karma, like positive and negative incentives to keep the system going. And that's what Eigenlayer does is make sure that as a staker, you don't have any incentive to try to like attack the system. Whereas also make sure that AVSs, you know, have no agency to attack the system. Even if they put in a buggy, firstly, they have to put in smart contract code, not like, you know, have arbitrary adjudication conditions, but smart contract code. And then even then there is a backstop in terms of a common slashing veto committee. My guess is that a lot of people who are 
kind of you know concern about systemic risks that Eigenlayer could introduce are almost confusing the concept of restaking with the concept of rehypothecation because they see this concept play out a lot in DeFi where somebody has a bunch of collateral and they use that to margin to do some sort of lending or borrowing and then they use the stuff they borrow to margin again and borrow more and more and more but this is something fundamentally different than that right so if if you do get slash it's not like everything just like every single app that's tied to that stake suddenly just like collapses as Stop functioning, right? Just to just to make that very clear to our listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are lots and lots of differences. I think to take the kind of comparison between the two, two things you just laid out. Imagine you take, uh, you know, people are thinking by restaking into hundred protocols is the same as, like, you know, taking a hundred x leverage position. Actually, these two concepts are not at all related. And the easiest way to see it is, if you take a hundred x, you know, margin lending position. If the market price of that asset moves 1%, you will get liquidated. You will lose your entire position. Whereas if I opt into 100 protocols and I don't act maliciously on any of them, I will never get slashed. It's a completely different thing. And you know maybe this analogy that I recently came up with may be useful. Imagine you go into a store, you know, you go into a mall, and then there is this main store that says that, hey, you have to put up a deposit. You know, if you come and steal anything here, you will lose your deposit. And then, you know, I come in and say, hey, anyway, the main store, you're putting up a hundred dollar deposit to enter. Why don't you make a promise that, you know, with this hundred dollar, you will not steal anything even on the other smaller stores in the mall. And they say, yeah, you know, now it's in your control to not steal at the mall, right? Like it's very different from taking a margin lending or any other kind of like financial position. So the risk is endogenous to the staker, except smart contract risk. And smart contract risk is just pervasive in all of blockchains. And that's just what it is, right? And even that we are trying to build a very cautious governed system in the beginning. Over time, these governance features can be removed. But that's the trade-off that we are taking is be cautious in protecting the stake. So, you know, to take another like mental model that people have, which is I think very erroneous, when 100 protocols are sharing common stake, the model is, oh, you know, maybe there's no risk from the staker side, maybe there's a risk from the protocol side or from the AVS side. And I think this is also erroneous. And the reason is if there are 100 protocols, each of which can sustain $1 billion staking on their own. Let's say that's the 100 protocols. And so, which means they're paying some amount of fee, which is sustaining that amount of stake in their platform. Now, if you aggregate all of this and create a $100 billion pool, this can be restaked across 100 protocols. The fee is identical to the previous world because you know, you're paying the same fee and you're able to sustain $100 billion. Now to attack any one protocol, you need $100 billion rather than requiring $1 billion. Security has this non-linearity where the more stake you need to do an attack, the more stake you need to actually profit out of and escape in real world with all this kind of crazy stuff becomes impossible. There is no liquidity on an exchange. There is no you know, tornado or whatever to go and hide your transactions. It's simply not possible to pull off an attack beyond a certain scale. So there's hardening of security that actually happens at scale. So that's the the other, I think, model which is missing because when people are thinking about 100 protocols sharing the same stake, they're thinking the amount of stake is going to remain the same as the number of protocols increases. But that's not the case. As more and more protocol bring more and more fees, the amount of stake will keep increasing. So this is a market equilibrium. and and another feature that we're building with Eigenlayer is what we call attributable security. When 100 protocols are sharing a common pool of, let's say, $100 billion of stake, there may be one protocol which says, hey, you know, I just not only want to have this pooled security, but I also want to have unique attributable security just to myself, which means even if all the protocols get attacked simultaneously, I should be able to slash and redistribute, let's say, $10 billion because I'm Coinbase. I want to, you know, be very sure. I want to be able to re, you know, slash and redistribute $10 billion on my own. You can do this on Eigenlayer. Eigenlayer gives you an ability to express both unique attributable security as well as pool security in a common system. And the power of pool security is very similar to why like nation states have like security functions, cities don't have security functions. It's because there is a hardening of security at scale. So 
that's the basic principle. And I think when Vitalik was discussing Aguilera recently, I think the two kind of uh, areas to look out for that he mentioned were the security and the centralization aspect. So I think we talked a lot about the security aspect. What are some considerations that we should have when we think about the centralization that Eigenlayer might or might not introduce? Yeah, I think this is a much, much more nuanced topic. You know, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, there are various layers of decentralization that, you know, protocols, uh, you know, like Ethereum may want to have. And you know, the most I think direct is operator decentralization. Does Eigenlayer contribute to more pressures for operators to centralize? Maybe there are only like a few operators when there are lots and lots of services that need to be opted into. And, you know, the answer to this is, you know, in, in the structure that we are building in Eigenlayer, we want to minimize the pressure to centralize. So this is a kind of like an operating principle that we are taking in building Eigenlayer. And, you know, if a different team was building Eigenlayer, they would operate on maybe different principles. But like I said, we came into the space because of like, you know, particularly building on Ethereum because of the shared values. And so one of the particular things we do is, can we try and encourage services which do not require a lot of computational effort? And this is how EigenDA, the first service is built on, Eigen, on EigenLayer. EigenDA is built to be horizontally scalable, which means as you increase the number of nodes, the system's performance keeps increasing. Rather than, the, I need to have a lot of node requirements on each node to satisfy a certain amount of bandwidth. So for example, systems like Solana scale by vertical scaling. Each node needs to have more and more in order to actually do well. And EigenDA scales horizontally, which means the total performance of the system is the product of the amount of bandwidth available in a node times the number of nodes. So you can increase it by like increasing the performance of a node, or you can increase it by increasing the number of nodes. And because the system is horizontally scaling, decentralization itself becomes scalability. The more nodes you have, the more bandwidth you have, and therefore you can scale. So this is a principle that we used to build EigenDA. Okay, beyond that, what can we do to encourage decentralization? And I think over time, what will happen is there will be services that require more centralized, you know, operations. There'll be services which will require more decentralized operations. And, you know, I give us this example, the secret sharing. Imagine I have a secret and I want to store it in a decentralized network. So each node has a little bit of the secret. If all the nodes were just the same party, it was all just Coinbase, like running hundreds of nodes, then I don't get any secret sharing benefit. It's the same guy, just like running 100 nodes and storing portions of the secret. So if I'm running a secret sharing network, I actually want decentralization. And so one of the really powerful things we're building with Eigenlayer is expressivity and flexibility for a service to specify that they only want, let's say, more decentralized operators. How do they know which operators are more decentralized? They can choose to use the oracles of their choosing to decide which are more decentralized and which are more centralized. Maybe something as simple as, I want to exclude all the exchange nodes and I want to exclude all the major LST nodes. Maybe a thing that somebody wants to do. So there are lots of expressivity in the Eigenlayer platform and if decentralized trust actually has utility, which is what we all believe, you know, Eigenlayer creates a marketplace for the decentralized nodes to potentially even more earn more than centralized nodes. Because, you know, you can't go to Ethereum today and say like, hey, I'm going to pay a transaction fee, but this transaction fee only goes to home stakers. That's not a thing. Like your transaction fee goes to whoever picks up the transaction and like mines it. But on Eigenlayer, you can actually do it. You can actually say like, hey, I only want to build an Oracle which uses the home stakers. And, you know, so we will find out the market value of decentralized trust by actually mm -hmm. allowing Eigenlayer to exist. And our thesis is, you know, there is enough interesting things to be built that decentralized trust has a real value. And actually for the first time, very first time in Ethereum, decentralized nodes could earn something more than centralized nodes. Still now, always the centralized nodes are better. 
Yeah, that's actually a huge reason why I was very excited to invest in Eigenlayer is because one of my big thesis is I believe crypto is the best way to create a market for anything. Um, and I think this is the first market for actual decentralized trust. You can actually put a value, like a dollar amount fee value on how much people want to pay different type of stakers and what sort of centralization they actually want to see beyond the posturing you see on Twitter because now people can put the money where their mouth is. So I'm very excited for that. Um, and I'd love to kind of talk about the commercial aspect as well, because one trend that I saw in the past few years is, you know, projects verticalizing into their own infrastructure. So you see dApps like DYDX becoming their own chain. You see some, uh, you know, guilds or games like Merit Circle, you know, verticalizing into their own chain. So it seems like the market is almost rewarding projects for becoming infrastructure, for verticalizing and creating their own L1s. So this is almost, would you say this is kind of antithetical to Eigenlayer since, you know, Eigenlayer is basically telling everybody that, hey, you don't need to do that. You can just simply use existing security from Ethereum. So from a commercial angle, you know, what drives founders of, you know, AVSs, of apps to use Eigenlayer versus becoming an L1 or L2 themselves? The way to think about it is if you are an AVS founder, what are the choices on the table? Option one, build with your own like token and your own trust network. And option two, build on top of an existing trust network like Ethereum Eigenlayer and, you know, deploy your service. And, you know, in the simplest world, one would say maybe a lot of AVSs would want to get started off as the second one, which is, you know, um, use uh, Ethereum and Eigenlayer and, you know, find product market fit and then maybe like go and do their own thing. Um so one of the things we did as you know we thought through like what are the incentives of the you know of the protocols we know that crypto runs on incentives if the incentive is not aligned people are not going to come and build on top of us one of the things we did is to break the binary choice between hey i stake my own token or i get security from ethereum we support natively what we call dual staking dual staking means I, as an AVS, can borrow trust from two distinct parties. One is stakers of my own token, whose whose interests are directly aligned with like the protocol's well-being because you know they have exposure to the token, and a neutral, high-value quorum which is coming from Ethereum. So you have we have this dual quorum model, which is a very popular model among the many AVSs. Even if they're launching on a single ETH quorum to begin with, over time, they have the idea to actually build their own other quorum. And instead of forcing a binary choice where we say, oh, either you choose your, your own token quorum or you choose you know, the ETH quorum, you can say, oh, I'm sending 80% of the fees to the ETH quorum and 20% to my own quorum today. And over time, I'm going to maybe spend send more to my quorum and less to Ethereum. Maybe at some point, I may even send zero to the Ethereum quorum and send all the value to myself. So what this means is specifically, if you try to use some kind of a discounted cash flow model to try to value like an AVS you know, a token, you might say that the total value that can be accrued by the AVS because you have and the thing is, this decision between how much value goes to the AVS token versus how much value goes to ETH is decided by the AVS's governance, which which will be in their own native token. So the at the end of the day, Eigenlayer is continuous and pure optionality. Like you have the option to use ETH if it is beneficial to you. You have the option to opt out if it is beneficial to you. And what this does is it makes it breaks this binary choice. And in in this world the value of the AVS token with Eigenlayer is actually only greater than the value in the absence of Eigenlayer because adding an option to consume additional security in a way that you can opt in and out as needed doesn't increase your like, uh, you know, uh, cost basis. So that's the first thing is the dual token model basically like completely breaks this artificial trade off and makes it very, very smooth for people to like borrow as much security as they need to keep their platform in, in continuous utility. Okay, so in, in this case, one of the downstream questions I get is, hey, does it mean that over time, uh, you know, services will launch on ETH Quorum and eventually just migrate on their own? And, you know, this is really a co question of 
whether Eigenlayer is viable not only as a bootstrapping platform for AVSs, but also as a continuous service platform for AVSs. And so it's incumbent on us to find ways to create synergies across these AVSs in a way that they actually want to stay rather than they are stuck with us and, you know, we have this, you know, entrenched monopoly to like keep this platform going. And there are many interesting ways we can actually do it. And one way, you know, I pointed to examples of the cloud early on. And one of the really powerful things, Amazon's cloud is called EC2, which is Elastic Cloud Compute, right? And Elastic Compute is the idea that I can borrow as much compute as I want. And Eigenlayer is elastic scaling of security. It's, you know, if Amazon's EC2, like Eigenlayer is ES2. And ES2 is basically elastic scaling of security, which is you can borrow how much security you want. And so why is this meaningful? Imagine a bridge, you know, who's doing a weekly transaction volume of like, you know, anywhere between 10 million and 200 million. So now how much security do I need? If I have to provision security separately for the bridge, I need to provision worst case 200 million. So I need to have 200 million of security just for my bridge. But in the eigenlayer worldview, there is this common huge pool of security. I can randomly pull the amount of security that I want, exactly like the cloud, which amortizes across all the services, creating a big compute platform from which you can pull the amount of compute that you want randomly. And that's exactly what happens with Eigenlayer. So this reduces dramatically the cost of security because you're not over provisioning for the worst case. You're, you're consuming security just in time, how much you need. So this is one benefit of Eigenlayer. There's also all kinds of other benefits where what happens is if a DAP consumes multiple Eigenlayer services, oh, I want an Oracle, I want a DA, I want some other thing. Instead of paying for security separately for each of these services, they can just pay one time because the same pool of security is backing all of these services. So there is an economy of scale in Eigenlayer that actually incentivizes services that kind of are mutually synergistic to stay together. So these are, you can create almost what, what I call like a, a X market bundling. Like instead of bun, you know, somebody could have thought and said, oh, let me create a new middleware, which is an Oracle plus DA plus AI together. But like, who knows how to build an Oracle plus DA plus AI together? In today's market condition, like figuring out how to build one is already a huge lift. So the Eigenlayer allows post-market bundling of these services into like useful things that services can consume, reducing the cost basis, as well as offering a consumer segment across these different services. Just like you go to AWS and you have a bunch of SaaS services and you just hook into like five, you know, a statistic is a typical Web2 app has 15 SaaS services integrated in the backend. Something like that could happen on Eigenlayer. And I think another kind of under uh, explored incentive for developers to stick around uh, with Eigenlayer long term is the fact that it enables kind of new primitives to be built. And one such new primitive that I came across uh, on your Twitter is this idea of like coprocessors, for instance. Um, and you kind of talked about this idea of like intelligent DeFi as well, which is, you know, not something that, at least I don't think you can build without Eigenlayer. So can you kind of break us down, you know, what exactly is a coprocessor and what did you mean by intelligent DeFi? Yeah, um, a, a coprocessor is kind of like a layer two system, but layer two normally you think of as like a chain. So this is one of the reasons I don't like the chain terminology. Mm -hmm. So imagine I'm sitting on Ethereum and I'm writing a smart contract program and you know maybe I'm on Uniswap. And you know one of the things I want to do is instead of doing passive liquidity provisioning, which is I just put it into a pool and you know fix a, a certain price level at which I'm provisioning liquidity. Instead, I want to dynamically move around the liquidity, right? But then the question is, who is doing it? Are you an active participant? Are you a passive participant? What is going on? And what might happen is somebody may come up with a machine learning or an AI protocol, which takes the history of all the transactions and moves around the liquidity like provisioning spectrum, right? Based on, you know, these hard inputs on the blockchain. Imagine that I can actually get high integrity provision of the service, which means when the service says that this is the right, like, you know, if I ran this AI on this history and this is the output I get, and it's absolutely correct. If you had this access, then what you could do is you could write, 
you know in uh, in, in your defi program that hey i'm i'm a passive provider but i'm provisioning liquidity to this ai protocol and you know i i'm just hands off after that point and the ai like sits and keeps adjusting your like you know liquidity range and this is a really like interesting service if it could be built but it's not possible to write this in evm or you know you know fit it into the small gas limit of ethereum but if i had an eigenlayer service that i can sit and call on on top of like ethereum these nodes run the ai service off chain and you know sign off on the imp the output of this ai service and then put it on top of ethereum back it with a certain amount of economic security now you have a rigid input that the protocol can take and move around this liquidity based on that this becomes really really powerful because now you know if we call you know this thing smart contracts right and you know smart contracts you know as they exist today are rigid but not that smart not that intelligent right you know smart means like oh is it an agent is it like doing complex like you know adaptations you have to write it in simple easy code like you know in uniswap has this curve called xy equals k which is like the first kind of simple programmatic thing that one might think of and what if instead like you had a complex expressivity while not giving up rigidity or correctness how can i get smart and you know accurate execution simultaneously and that's what eigenlayer promises there are other technologies like zk proofs which could give you this but they're very very expensive today you know running a zk proof may be as expensive as 100000 times just running the software you know this is this is possible for simple applications but when i'm when you're talking about running complex ai it, this cost just like blows up out of control whereas on eigen layer you don't incur such a cost so that's that's the idea of crypto economic coprocessors i'm going to link your tweet in the show notes below as well for anyone who wants to check out this idea because i think this is one of the more interesting directions that defi can take that can really revitalize um now sriram i think my last question for you just to wrap us up is uh let's assume that there are many parallel realities and we're able to zoom out and see all these realities and in one reality we have eigen layer at its most successful and then one where everything's gone wrong something has you know horrible happened something horrible has happened so what would eigen layer look like in these two universes like what is the most kind of successful outcome you can see and the least successful outcome for eigen layer the most successful outcome for eigen layer would be that you know it it accelerates this whole crypto vision which is that we can actually enable anybody to come and build new and interesting services on top of a common coordination layer and so what that means is you have this rich world of not only like you know we talk about end users owning assets but also developers owning the platform or like working on immutable platforms on which they are building their projects so their long term source of sustenance is actually like really rewarded so many people coming and building new interesting services you know a rich and vibrant economy of consumption of these services to build things like the open metaverse to build our decentralized agi to build things like you know secure uh, private homomorphic encryption all kinds of interesting things running on top of this common substrate so that's what the most successful interesting world for eigen layer looks like what is the most catastrophic thing that can happen uh we think about this a lot you know because we want to make sure that we maximize the likelihood of the successful outcome and minimize the likelihood of the catastrophic outcome what would a catastrophic outcome be something got hacked right and you know people lost money i think that would be a catastrophic outcome uh we we take a lot of precaution to try to ensure that that's very unlikely but in blockchains you know you, we don't know these are new and inter- new systems so there is always some risk that you know nobody understands so that's that's one one aspect that could be some co- smart contract problems in the uh, uh in the eigen layer ecosystem that leads to you know some kind of loss of funds okay the other catastrophic outcome i can envision is something happening not in eigen layer but some like you know layers on top and one kind of a layer on top is this financialization layer where something like you know there is this whole ecosystem of 
liquid restaking tokens and what they do is they take people who have staked uh, you know in the eigenlayer protocol and issue like a receipt token which is representing their position in eigenlayer this itself i think is not at all harmful like having a liquid representation of your token actually buffers the system quite heavily because when somebody has if you don't have a liquid restaking position what might happen is if somebody uh, has a staked position and wants to go and collateralize it to like do lending or borrowing or whatever and they get liquidated then the only way to like clear off their loan is to go and withdraw from eigenlayer and from ethereum their stake and this leads to like you know uh, pressures into the protocol into the eigenlayer protocol as well as into ethereum itself and what a liquid restaking token does is by issuing a fungible representation which is a token that can just be that change hands instead of you know actually going and withdrawing it actually buffers the risk out of the deeper layers of the stack but what we see happening which might be a risk to the financialized infrastructure on top is people taking leverage on top of their liquid restaking positions you know when people are worried about leverage in eigenlayer this is the place we should focus on is are people lending and borrowing against their liquid restaking tokens in a kind of unmeasured you know way you know ideally there is no leverage but at, you know in practice leverage should be kept very minimal and this is where I, I would urge the lending protocols for example to urge caution when estimating the value of a liquid restaking token instead of like pegging it at it will always be one is to one to ETH they should take cautious approach so that people don't take excess risk and externalize it onto other parties who may then have lent their ETH into these lending protocols and so on. So that's the place where I can see some kind of financialization go wrong. This is one of the reasons we don't necessarily either build these liquidity staking tokens or you know lending platforms, but we do want to urge all the users to exercise caution at these layers to minimize this kind of an outcome. Yeah, well, Sir, I'm really appreciative of how candid you are with this, and I look forward to seeing you make sure that the universe we live in is the first one and not the second one. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the show, and we're going to put your socials in the show notes below as well. So for listeners at home or you know, if you're watching this on YouTube, just click on the drop down and you can follow Sir Ram on Twitter. So thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Really enjoyed this conversation, Jason. Hey, thanks for supporting another episode of the Block Crunch podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you're listening to this on. It really helps us a lot. Or if you prefer YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel on YouTube as well to not miss an episode. I'd love to hear from you guys as well. And I personally make sure to read every single comment on YouTube or tweets that are directed at me. So feel free to leave a comment there. Let us know what project you want us to bring on or what trends you want us to talk about or tweet at me at Mr. Jason Choi or at The Block Crunch on the platform previously known as Twitter, currently known as X. And thank you so much for supporting and I'll see you in the next episode.